My name is Amy Lambert. Okay, Anna, we're gonna make brownies, okay? Yeah. I have two daughters, Anna, who's two and a half, and Beatrice, who's six months. We try to have most everything homemade in our home and not have processed things coming into our home. Can you take the shell out and put it in the sink? My husband is Jeremy Liu. We're trying to get my two-year-old to like fish. Okay, we can talk about fish. I associate mercury dangers with fish. There seem to be more harmful compounds and things we eat and drink every day, and that's certainly a concern. Well, be careful, Dad. I am being careful. Fish contain mercury, and mercury is a toxin. It's hard to know whether it's harmful or not in the levels that are around. The internet is a blessing and a curse when it comes to finding out information about things which you suspect you don't know. Eating fish is a really important part of a healthy diet. Women of childbearing age and young children should limit the consumption of high mercury fish. I guess my question is what to feed the babies at this point. We get most of our fish from the sea. And that's where uh, mercury builds up in our food supply. Fish is a very healthy food source, and we've contaminated it with mercury. Are you using those pipe packs right there? Yep. Celia Chen is an amazing researcher. She has the vision to focus our attention on an area, surprisingly, that has had so little research done, the marine environment. Her work has focused on um, how mercury builds up in food chains. We started out studying mostly lakes, and then we sort of turned our research more towards marine ecosystems. Because most of the fish people, certainly in the U.S., consume are mostly marine fish. People actually don't even know where mercury in the environment is coming from. I don't know where the mercury comes from that comes into our environment. I assume environmental mercury in fish comes from uh, pollution in the sea, runoff and trash and things being dumped in the ocean. Mercury is coming from lots of different sources. There's mercury use in, in gold and precious metal mining. In the chloralkali industry, in industrial boilers, and in consumer products. Human activity has put a large amount of mercury into the atmosphere. Coal-fired power plants are the number one source of mercury air emissions in the world. Mercury is preserved in the coal, so when we burn it, that mercury is then released and gets up into the atmosphere, and it accumulates both in waterways and on the land. The kind of research that we've been doing at Dartmouth has mostly been about the amount of mercury that gets into organisms and how that goes from one organism to the organism that, you know, consumes it. The mercury emissions get deposited in the open ocean. So how does it end up getting to the fish that we eat? At the very bottom of the food web, it's taken up by phytoplankton and zooplankton that then are eaten by really small fish. Beyond that, bigger fish that eat the smaller fish and so on and so forth. So a lot of it is fish eating fish. And so the fish that we eat, those are the ones that are at the top. So it's biomagnified, you know, many, many times over as it goes up that food chain. The problem is that we have doubled the amount of mercury in our environment from pre-industrial times. And two-thirds of that comes from what humans have emitted. Some of the mercury coming out of the stacks travels around the world before it gets deposited. When we did a study of all these lakes in the Northeast, it's the most pristine lakes, those ones in gorgeous New Hampshire and northern Maine that had the highest mercury in fish. Of all the pollutants, it's one that, you know, being remote from the source doesn't really help. The reason that it's important for people to know that most of this contaminant in the atmosphere is from coal-fired plants is because that's very connected to human decisions. As a society, we can make choices to help control these emissions and help reduce exposures. 
So there are choices that we can make, like using different kinds of bulbs that are lower energy to reduce energy consumption. The careful scientific research that we've done tells us it's important to control the sources now, and it will have an effect on how much mercury gets into our fish. Hello, little mouse. Mercury is toxic to many tissues of the body, but the nervous system is especially sensitive to the harmful effects of mercury. Pregnancy and the first few years after birth are especially sensitive periods for long-term health effects. The big hungry bear can smell a red ripe strawberry a mile away. There's very clear evidence that mercury causes neurodevelopmental delay in children. We're talking about subtle delays in development of verbal language, attention, and, and other aspects of child development. Can you eat that strawberry? We know that the fetus is growing and developing at an incredibly rapid rate, and you know half of your cells that you're going to produce are produced during fetal life, and so providing specific advice about what can be eaten would be helpful. With each pregnancy, you sit down with the doctor and they give you the checklist of things that you need to be aware of. The fish that are especially high in mercury that pregnant women should stay away from are things like shark and swordfish, king mackerel, and tilefish. Those are the big four. Um, other fish that are um, bigger and higher in mercury include um, tuna, especially the bigger tuna that's included in tuna steak or tuna sushi. The concentrations in albacore tuna are three times higher than the concentrations in the light hand tuna. There are certain types of fish that we know that tend to be very low in mercury, and those include smaller fish, anything that you can sort of see the whole thing, the head and tail on the body. Mm -hmm. So sardines, little fish like that, and also things that don't eat a lot of little fish, like catfish, flounder, the tilapia, the kind of white meat fish, and then also things like trout and salmon. So my OBGYN um, at the beginning of the pregnancy sat down with a, a laundry list of do's and don'ts for eating. So that's my association with mercury and what harm it might cause. People respond and pay attention to messages about risk much more than messages about benefit. So you can tell the same person that eating fish is going to be good for your baby's brain, but eating fish with mercury is going to be risky, and they forget the first message. It's very common that people just use a risk avoidance approach and say, well, um, it, I think there's a risk there. It's, it's too, too confusing and it would take too much time for me to really figure out the subtleties, and so I'm going to minimize my consumption of fish. Ironically, many, many studies have shown clearly that, that women who don't eat fish at all their, their children also have those neurodevelopmental delays. So, so not eating fish is, is not a good option. Women who are eating about two or more servings a week of fish seem to have kids that um, do better developmentally. Um, these are lower mercury fish. Thank you. There's one omega-3 fatty acid in fish called DHA, which is a building block of the nerve tissue in the brain and the eyes. And most of that uptake happens in fetal life in the first couple years of life after birth. It's a food that's a good source of protein, uh, doesn't have a lot of harmful nutrients like saturated fats, trans fats, and it has a lot of healthful nutrients including vitamin D, selenium, and omega-3 fatty acids. So don't avoid fish just because of concerns about mercury. There are lots of fish to be eating. Once in a while, there's, there's a case report uh, of somebody who, who you know, consumes the same kind of very high-level sushi uh, with high-level mercury every day or several times a day for prolonged exposure and develops acute mercury toxicity from very high levels. An adult can experience neurologic symptoms related to frequent consumption of fish that's higher in mercury. And we don't know exactly where that threshold is. Part of the reason is that probably different people have different sensitivities. And again, it's pretty rare in the United States. It's reversible. Um, it's, it's really happens in just a few people. The EPA and FDA published joint guidelines recommending that women should try to eat two servings a week of fish. But if you are a woman of childbearing age, you want to limit your consumption of high mercury fish. There's things that we can do as a society to control mercury emissions and we really want to protect fish for future generations. Tell your Congress people that you don't want to have to worry about how much mercury is in your fish. You want to be able to eat a healthy food source. You want your children, you want your grandchildren to be able to do that as well. Your voice matters. So tell the people that have power to affect change.
People often ask me, do you eat fish? And I'd say, yes, of course. I love fish, yeah. I eat a lot of seafood. I eat a lot of it sometimes. We, we eat fish frequently. So we have a daughter who's almost three and a daughter who's about one and a half. And um, so both of them loved fish and we gave them lots of salmon. They eat salmon, they eat tilapia, they eat um, trout, so they actually like it. I would tell another mother that it's important for them to buy and consume fish because we know that there's a lot of nutritional value. You want some fish for dinner? <laughs>